It's like I'm having a little seance. I dyed my hair and I'm wearing earrings. Hi, my beautiful friends. How are you today? I hope you're having a wonderful day so far. As good as it can be right now. Yes. <sighs> Hi, my name is Bailey Sarian, and today is Monday, which means it's murder, mystery, and makeup. Monday! If you're new here, hi. Every Monday I sit down and I talk about a true crime story that's been heavy on my... Uh-oh. Oh, it's kind of like low battery. Noggin. And I do my makeup at the same time. If you're interested in true crime and you like makeup, I would highly suggest you hit that subscribe button because I'm here for you every Monday. And I upload on Saturdays as well, except this last Saturday, I, I skipped it. Sorry about that. Oh, remember skip it? Skip it, skip it. Hey, so I dyed my hair. Look, it was supposed to be like a nice chocolate brown, but I left it on too long or something. I don't know. And it's kind of blackish. Maybe it will fade, maybe it won't. I'm not really that mad at it. I really need some change. Thank you. <laughs> Last week, we talked about Eileen Warnos, remember? Wow, what a, I was gonna say great story, but whoa, Bailey, calm down. Eileen, poor Eileen, not poor, well, she had a rough, a very rough life, holy crap, right? So today, I thought we could do a missing person story, and a handful of uh, messages and requests I've gotten was to cover this story, and apparently it's huge in Canada. Um, I don't know why I haven't heard about it, it kind of seems like everyone has, but I hadn't heard about it, so I thought, hey, Let's talk about it and maybe, I don't know, maybe someone has seen her or something. I don't know. Yeah. I'm sinking again. I'm doing it again. <sighs> okay. I will shut up. I will stop rambling and let's get right into it. Today we're going to be talking about Emma Filipov. Now Emma just seemed to vanish and disappear into thin air. She's been missing. Emma was living in Perth, Ontario, but always wanted to live out West and move to Victoria, British Columbia in the fall of 2011. Emma was 25 and at this time she had no home, but she figured, you know what? I'm just gonna move because she always wanted to. And it was like one of those now or never type of deals. She didn't have kids. She wasn't married, why not? Emma's plan was to figure it out like once she got there. And she told a friend that she had, she had a feeling that something amazing was gonna happen while she was out there in Victoria. So once she made the move to Victoria, Emma, she would end up moving in with a childhood friend and their partner for a few months. And after a few months, Emma actually stayed in the same like apartment complex, but just moved into another unit in the same building. I guess she really liked it. In the winter of 2011, Emma, she ended up getting a job working as a barista at a cafe, but that didn't really last long for her. Over time, Emma ended up just, I don't know, she was more of a free spirit. She didn't really like to be tied down anywhere. And when she left the job, she ended up moving in with another friend for a few months. And they ended up living in a hotel named Hotel 760. And also Emma got a job cleaning rooms there as well. But over time, again, Emma was just more of a free spirit and she would end up just going wherever she wanted. So some nights she, it was said that she would like sleep in the woods, but she would sleep like in a tree, in a tree trunk type of deal, you know? Or the arm of a tree, like a big tree. She liked trees. She even uh, lived on a boat, like a houseboat for a little bit. And she was just free to come and go as she pleased. I think it's pretty cool. Also from February to November of 2012, Emma would stay at a shelter, a woman's shelter shelter called Sandy Merriman shelter. And usually she would do this for like a month at a time or whenever she just really needed somewhere to stay. And then in 2012, Emma obtained a seasonal job at an Inner Harbor seafood eatery called Redfish Bluefish. And she worked there until October 31st, 2012. And then she was expected to return back in February of 2013. Like it was already locked in, she was gonna go back. So while living in Victoria, Emma would check in with her friends and family back home by making occasional phone calls, especially like on the holiday season or just the holidays. And then also she would write emails and apparently, allegedly, according to friends and family, they were like poetic, upbeat emails, you know? At this time, she, Emma, didn't tell her friends or family that she was staying at a shelter. Maybe she just didn't want anybody to worry about her. I'm not really sure. I guess I shouldn't make assumptions, but she didn't let anyone know. But it was said that 
Emma enjoyed spending time with members of the homeless community, with boat owners and artists down at the Inner Harbor, and with street performers around the town. She made many friends with a whole bunch of different backgrounds, and many of them would describe her as free-spirited, creative, adventurous, soft-spoken, highly sensitive to people, and brave. Sometimes I think like, what would people describe me as? But then I also don't wanna know. It was also said that Emma preferred nature over city life. Um, you could find her walking around barefoot, ouch, but you know, like she was just, she enjoyed being free. I think we all know someone like that, right? But I don't, I, I doubt we all know someone like that. Do we? Let's talk about it. Do we know someone like that? The summer of 2012, friends said that Emma was in search of like a more pure lifestyle. Pure meaning she quit drinking, she quit smoking cigarettes, and then she also quit drinking coffee and sugar. Also, Emma was vegan and she was slowly starting to cut out any type of like garbage food. Not that she was eating garbage. She like, you know, the stuff that has all the, the crap in it, the GMO, you know, she wanted to eat like natural. There you go. By late summer, she was eating less and less and drinking a ton of water daily. And then friends said that she had gotten really, really thin and they described her as becoming monk-like um, when it came to her social and eating habits. In June or July of 2012, Emma purchased a van with the intention of living in it and traveling around from place to place. Emma was really excited about the adventure and the independence the van would bring her. Over time though, it turned into a financial burden. It had gotten towed three times. It had car issues, van issues. It had van issues and it just wasn't what she thought it was, it was gonna be, which was a bummer. It was said before Emma vanished, she was actually asking around for an inexpensive mechanic. As winter was approaching, Emma seemed to become unsure about where to go and what to do with herself during the winter months. Um, you know, I mean, it's cold. Hello, she can't sleep outside. She began to distance herself from others and her friends, but her friends would say that she started to become really fearful and withdrawn, but also a little paranoid as well. In mid-November, Emma told a friend that she was leaving Victoria and possibly heading to Salt Spring Island Island, um, in British Columbia. Other friends were told that she was going to sail on a boat to Mexico or that she was heading to San Juan with a man she barely knew or that she was moving to California, moving to Costa Rica, traveling to Japan with her father, living off the grid somewhere in the woods. And she also told a friend that she would be surprising her family by going back home to Perth, Ontario. So she kept telling people different stories about where she was going and what her plan was. It's obvious maybe. She really didn't have a plan or she had too many plans and she didn't know which one she wanted to go with. There were early warning signs that Emma may have been privately suffering with mental health issues as early as the age of 11. A childhood friend of Emma's said that she would often see Emma obsessively arranging patterns using objects like feathers, shells, rocks, and even food. And that same friend actually contacted Emma's father out of concern after she she woke up one night and found Emma outside in like a euphoric state. She was high like on, on the grass, like a hill area, and she was just staring up at the stars. So this friend that she was staying with sees Emma, and this is concerning because she's not acting like herself, like what is she doing? So she actually reaches out and calls her father, Emma's father. The next day, Emma's father actually reached out to Emma and offered to um, pay for a ticket for her to fly home. But when Emma found out that her father was contacting it in the first place, it actually made her really upset and she insisted that she would be fine on her own. She didn't want, she didn't want his help. Emma's father at this time did not tell Emma's mom about the incident. She, he didn't tell her anything until later on. Now, Emma's mom and dad, they would actually end up getting a divorce later on. Her name is Shelly, Emma's mom. And she said that if she had known about this first incident, you know, when he got the phone call, she would have flown out immediately, but because it wasn't mentioned to her, she, she obviously didn't. According to three different friends, Emma had been experiencing ongoing stress due to feeling harassed by someone that she had a bad experience with years ago back in British Columbia. Back in British Columbia in 2009, that's where Emma was studying culinary arts. 
Unfortunately though, Emma didn't give any details or even mention this stalker's or harasser's name to her friends. And also Emma had a diary or a journal and she didn't even mention this person's name in her journal. She's so weird. A roommate would say that Emma would tell her that she wanted to avoid social situations where she, Emma, had to interact with any type of men, which would be the main reason why she chose not to stay at like co-ed shelters. She only stayed at women's shelters. Anytime this roommate would ask Emma if she wanted to, I don't know, go to a party or just go hang out somewhere. And if there were men there, she would, uh-uh, she didn't want to. Based off of what friends said, it's, Stuff. Emma wasn't always like this. Something must have happened, you know? Two weeks before Emma would vanish, one friend said that they were driving by the shelter and saw Emma outside looking cold and wet and she was just standing there motionless. And Emma was just like blankly staring at a bunch of birds. So this person sees her and th just noted it, thought it was weird, but they were driving. So it's not like they stopped and asked how she was doing. The shelter that Emma was staying in, the staff there, they also said that they noticed signs of paranoia and depression, that Emma would keep her curtains drawn at all times and was discovered frantically moving furniture from the shelter out to the curb and also like across the street because she claimed, Emma claimed, that they were making too much noise and speaking to her. Because of all of this, the shelter staff actually called police to do a, or to request a mental health check. The staff over the phone, they had explained the situation like what was going on to police. And police told the staff to call back if they noticed any more odd behavior um, going on with Emma, but they didn't come out and do a check or anything. So the staff was like, okay, I guess if we notice anything, we'll call back. The staff there did not call Emma's parents because privacy laws, like she's... 25, so they didn't call her parents. On the night of November 23rd, Emma, she actually made a series of phone calls to her mom. Shelly, Emma's mom, assured her that she was going to get a ticket and come out there to Emma, and then they could both just come back home, you know? But Emma would call back either hours later or the next day and tell her mom, like, don't come out. I'm just gonna stay out here in Victoria to work things out on my own, and I'll be okay. Don't come. And then she would call her back and be like, okay, you can come. And then she would call her back and be like, no, don't come. Like, it kept flip-flopping, and Emma just couldn't decide, like, what to do. And this lasted four days, this flip-flop. Like, Okay, yeah, come. Okay, no, don't come. Okay, yeah, come. No, 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 no. So at this time, Emma's mom, Shelly, she didn't know where Emma was staying at. And she was growing very concerned, very worried for her daughter. And she didn't really know how to get in contact with her. So she decided to like call back the number that popped up on the phone that was on display. So she calls this number thinking that Emma is probably just staying with a friend. When someone answers, she asks like, what is this place? And she realizes that Emma has been living like at a woman's shelter on and off since winter of 2011. She was talking to the, the staff person about this. And Emma's mom was just completely shocked because she had no idea. Emma's final call to her mother was on the morning of November 28th. And she told her mom, quote, don't come mom, not today, end quote. Shelly, Emma's mom, said that there was a noticeable change in Emma's voice, uh, which made her really, really worried. So I guess this is like, you know, I think any of us would do this. Um, Shelly, Emma's mom, she was t talking amongst other family members saying what's going on and how she's really worried about Emma. Shelly said that some of the family members were telling her like, don't worry about it. She's an adult. We need to respect Emma's independence. She's 25, like don't worry about it. She's gonna figure it out. But Shelly knew something deep down that something's just not right, you know? So Shelly decided she's just gonna put everything on hold and she took a flight that same afternoon to go get or at least go see Emma. According to witnesses, Emma returned to the shelter around 6 p.m. that evening and told a staff member that her mother was on her way. The staff member said that Emma became visibly upset and anxious, then stormed out of the shelter. Another resident um, had run after Emma outside, but was unable to catch up with her. Shelly arrived at the shelter at around 11 p.m. and that's when she learned Emma did not claim her bed that night. And Shelly had no idea where, where Emma was and 
at that point, nobody knew where she was. Um, she had no way to contact her. So shortly after midnight, shelter staff called police to report Emma as a missing person. Let's break it down now as like a timeline because that was the last time anyone had seen her. Like what happened to her, right? Tuesday, November 20th, we're going backwards now. That was like the summary, now this is like the timeline. <laughs> okay. Cool. Do I look scary? Cause I kind of feel scary. Timeline and sightings. November 20th, Emma visits the YMCA to take out a membership. There's a surveillance video that shows her entering and exiting the building four times within a 14 minute period. Emma seems very nervous. You can see her like peering out the glass doors, like kind of looking as if like she's waiting for somebody or she's hiding from someone or something. Some think that she's holding something in her hands like a cell phone or an iPhone, but others uh, suspect that she's just kind of fidgeting with her fingers, you know? On Wednesday, November 28th, this is the day that Emma uh, disappears at 4.30 a.m. Emma calls her mom, changing her mind one last time saying, quote, don't come mom, not today. Shelly tells Emma she won't fly to Victoria, but decides to take the first flight out that afternoon. 7 a.m., Emma goes to the Chateau Victoria, which is a hotel, and she gets very upset because she finds out that on her van is a notice saying that she needs to move the van, um, and if she doesn't, then it's gonna be towed. So Emma went inside and she asked a staff member, she asked if she could move the van another day, and they said yes, but they were working with her, you know? And there is a surveillance of that as well. 8.23 a.m., Emma is captured on a video surveillance at the 7-Eleven store, and there is where she uses her debit card to purchase a $200 prepaid credit card. She was wearing a beige winter jacket, camo pants. She had several bags with her, one like over her shoulder. She had an orange purse with her, which would be like her main bag. You know, like the purse or the, the bag you have has all your daily nonsense in it. Wallet, phone, cards, candy wrappers. There's always like crumbs in the bottom of the bag. No one knows why it's weird, but she got the orange bag with her. Okay, and on the footage, you can see her peering out the window again. She's looking really nervous about something. She just is kind of standing there looking. She's hesitant to like go outside. It's very strange. At 10 a.m., a friend was riding the bus when this friend looks out the window and he sees Emma standing on the edge of like uh, the sidewalk, one step away from the road, like the street, the busy street. At this point, she was wearing a puffy, light colored coat. Her hoodie was pulled over her head. She was carrying plastic bags in each hand. And then she also had more bags over her shoulder and across her chest. So this friend was on the bus and they see um, they see Emma, so they get off and they approach Emma asking it like, do you need help? Are you okay? And Emma just shook her head, no, but she was just standing there motionless and it was weird. So the friend just stood there for a while asking, do you need help? What are you doing? Like trying to get some kind of answer from her, but he didn't get any response from Emma. So he just decided to leave, which he did. In the early afternoon, a friend saw Emma at a local soup kitchen and this friend went up to Emma as well and Emma said she wasn't feeling well and that she couldn't talk. This friend said that they asked if Emma needed a hug, you know, like, yeah, I'm not feeling well. And then your friend says like, oh, do you need a hug? Like that's what they had asked Emma. But instead, Emma had just like given this horrific look on her face um, and said no. So after 1 p.m. sometime, two people report seeing Emma on Douglas Street sometime in the afternoon. And they were so concerned by Emma's strange behavior of walking back and forth in the street, looking lost and confused, that they immediately called police who took a report. It's unclear if police actually would follow up with that call, but they would be the first to call 911 about Emma that day. There was another report from a witness saying that they saw Emma walking downtown with a an older man. Um, no description of this older man was given or just provided. It was a sighting 
at 5.54 p.m. Emma uses her debit card to purchase um, a cell phone at the same 7-Eleven where she purchased the prepaid credit card. Video surveillance uh, shows her paying for the phone. Then she lingers in the store by the doors. And again, she's looking nervous and she's kind of peering outside as if somebody is, is out there. Like she's afraid of them. She's afraid to leave or she's just trying to avoid somebody. The cell phone that was purchased at that 7-Eleven store was actually never activated. At 6 p.m., Emma goes to the shelter. Witnesses at the shelter reported that Emma became very anxious and upset when she told a staff member that her mother was on the way. And that's when she storms out. 6.10, a taxi driver picks Emma up near the shelter and she asked him to take her to the airport, but then suddenly she changes her mind. Emma tells the driver that she can't afford the $60 taxi ride. And she asked the taxi driver to be dropped off exactly where she was picked up. At this time, it was said that Emma had two to $3,000 in her bank account. And also she had just purchased that prepaid credit card, remember? $200. So technically she had money, but not sure what was, yeah. When the taxi driver pulls up to drop her off, Emma asked the driver if she could just sit in the taxi for a little bit. And so he's like, okay, yeah, that's fine. And the driver would say that she was behaving very oddly and that she became very anxious and paranoid when she hears the dispatch radio go off. Emma had asked the taxi driver, quote, why is there noise coming out of that, end quote. At 6.15, an acquaintance of Emma sees her standing barefoot on the corner. She's looking disoriented um, and it seems like she was unable to cross the street. He had asked her if she was looking for someone or if someone was following her just because of how she was acting. Like he said that she was acting very paranoid. Emma doesn't say much, but she does keep like looking around, right? Kind of sketched out, but she did end up asking him to walk with her for a little bit. That's when he would ask Emma, like, what, what are you doing? Where are you going? And this was when Emma got a little irritated and all these questions were making her uncomfortable. So she tells him that she's going on a walk on her own. At 7 p.m., this acquaintance enters a nearby restaurant and calls calls the police and waits until they arrive. So this friend really thought something was, was wrong with her enough to go and call the police. At 7.15 PM, police find Emma barefoot. She's holding her shoes and two police officers assess her for 45 minutes. According to police notes, um, at no time did Emma engage with police. Instead, she would give one worded answers or just nod her head, yes or no, or like shake her head, you know. And by 8 PM, police decide that she is not a threat to herself or anyone else and they watch her walk away. This is the last confirmed sighting of Emma. I know, I don't know. The identity of the two officers were protected by privacy laws and details of the conversation have not been released. Shelly, Emma's mom, sent in a freedom of information request in May of 2015, but it was denied by the police department without any reason. Emma's mom is wanting to know like, well, what happened? What did she say? Where did she say she was going? You know, just information, any clues? I think the police department is trying to cover their tracks like so they don't get in trouble as to why they didn't take her somewhere. No, I don't know, we, I can't make assumptions. I have to stop doing that. After Emma's disappearance, November 29th, 2012, Chateau Victoria, the hotel where Emma had left her van, they had arranged for a towing company to come and get Emma's van. Police find it at the towing lot hours later, containing almost all of her possessions, including her passport, laptop, journals, camera, and recently borrowed library books. Police then have it towed to their lot instead. On November 29th, Shelly goes back to the shelter during each shift change. And that's when she's able to talk to people and learn that Emma had become depressed and possibly suicidal, that she had been growing more and more paranoid, erratic, and fearful in the last two weeks or the two weeks leading up to her disappearance. Between end of November and December 2nd, two witness reports claimed to have seen Emma, but they were unconfirmed. December 5th at 11, 17 a.m., the $200 
your prepaid credit card Emma purchased is flagged for use at a gas station. That's great news, right? Like this credit card is being used. I mean, Emma bought it, so they're thinking it's gotta be Emma, right? So they go and they check it out and it wasn't Emma. Instead, it was a man who said he had found it, the card on the side of the road. This man was brought into the police station to be questioned. And that's where he would actually be cleared because he passed the polygraph test and they just felt like he wasn't the guy. Shelly said that this man would call her on three different occasions and told her that he was drinking on a daily basis at the time. And he was too drunk to, to remember that night when he had found it. He knew it was still sealed and he was certain he waited about a week to use it to buy a carton of cigarettes. He still claims he can only guess where he may have found the card, but he wasn't really sure. That sucks. On May of 2014 in Gastown, I feel like when a word is too easy, it's a setup and it's never really how, how you say it. British Columbia, what seemed to be an irritated man was captured on surveillance at a clothing store in downtown Vancouver with a crumpled up missing persons poster. Now guess which missing person poster this is. Emma. They put posters up, a missing person poster, and it had Emma's picture on it, and they put it everywhere. So this man that they see on surveillance is, he appears to be irritated, agitated, grumpy, very grumpy. And he has in his hand a crumpled up piece of paper, and it was the missing person's poster of Emma. It was in his hand right? Who's he? I don't know. He claimed that Emma was his girlfriend and just wanted to be left alone. The footage is grainy and shows a man in a green shirt with a noticeable limp and flame tattoos on his arm. Now, nobody has come forward to help identify this man. They don't know who this man is. I feel like personal opinion that this man may have been involved with the situation, right? Like, who is this guy? Why would he tear down that poster? I mean, there could be logical reasons, but come on, you know? Anyways, but this guy has never been identified. Following Emma's disappearance, a search team, friends, family, volunteers, they had searched Victoria and the communities of Vancouver Island. They have searched trails, parks, smaller islands, anywhere and everywhere. Eventually the target area widened to include the um, British Columbia mainland and locations across Canada and the US. I know it was everywhere. I feel like, why did I miss this? So they were trying to get it out everywhere. Like, have you seen this girl? They also, uh, the family had hired a private investigator. This private investigator had worked on the case for a year, but they could not locate Emma and they would just hit dead end after dead end after dead end. Several psychics and mediums provided input, but Emma, Emma has yet to be found. There were several unconfirmed sightings in Fernwood Square, Goldstream Park, and the Inner Harbor. Several witnesses had reported that her missing person poster had been torn down in downtown East Side. Um, a witness said that they believed to have seen Emma ripping down her own poster off the wall, but it's unconfirmed confirmed if it was her or not, you know? So we're not really even sure if that was her. Staff at a hunting um, or fishing store reported a woman who resembled Emma had come in and had asked how to disappear, had asked the, the worker guy, how do you, how to disappear? Saying that she had a stalker who followed her from Ontario to Victoria and then Vancouver. Two separate tips in early 2014, a hitchhiker matching Emma's description was seen on highway three near the family farm. The second sighting was up in Slocan Valley, Slocan Valley, about 30 minutes away from where another family member lived. These sightings remain unconfirmed. So in 2018, this took place in 2013? Yeah, five years later. Dang. So in 2018, a new witness came forward. I know, five years later. Now this new witness was a man who said he was on his way to work. He was driving, right? He was starting a new job and he had to be there pretty early. So it's about 5 a.m. he said, and it was on November 29th, 2012. He said he saw a young woman darting back and forth on the side of the road. He said that she seemed to be in distress. So he pulls over, asks if she, if she needs, needs a ride or, or help, 
right? But this lady, this girl gets into his car. He noticed that she wasn't wearing any shoes and she was soaking wet like she had been walking just all night. When she stepped into the car, she asked if he could drive her to Colwood to visit a girlfriend. And since he didn't want to be late to work, he told her that he could bring her a little bit closer to Colwood, but not drive her there. So he was just gonna like take her a little bit of the way, but not the full way. After driving around for five minutes, well, driving in the direction that he was gonna drive her in, he stops and he drops her off next to a 24 hour gas station. He said that the moment she got out of the car, her behavior shifted back to paranoia and she darted back and forth in the street before finally taking off in the direction of Colwood. This guy didn't know who he had picked up that morning until long after the incident took place. I mean, obviously he came forward almost six years later in June of 2018. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think like, how do you not know? But look at me, I didn't even know about this story. So it can happen anyways, but he contacted the police who then told him to contact Crime Stoppers and tell them about the interaction with Emma. When he realized there was no follow-up to this tip, he got in touch with with Emma's mother himself and a longtime advocate in the search of em for Emma. Um, this lady's name was Kimberly. Yeah, she was like the head of this Emma search party. I don't wanna like make it sound like she doesn't like just some search party cause she's doing a lot more, but okay anyways. So he contacts Emma's mom and Kimberly and Kimberly, she had interviewed him at length for a podcast and she released the podcast on November of 2019 and it's called The Search for Emma Philip Philipoff. I'll link it down below too if you wanna take a listen to it. It's really, really interesting. And that currently as of right now is where this story is at, I mean, it hasn't been seen. There have been a lot of sightings, but again, they're mainly unconfirmed. Yeah, they're all unconfirmed, but I think this guy who was the driver at least lets people know that like she was there November 29th, you know, like she could still be alive. She could still be alive. We don't know, we don't know. Okay, anyone with information on Emma's whereabouts is asked to contact the Victoria Police non-emergency line or you can contact Crime Stoppers um, and let them know as well. I'm gonna put in the description box the numbers and then also the pinned comment as well. I just need to double check that I have them right before voicing them. And that my friends is a story about Emma Philip Philipoff. Philipoff, very interesting story. It was very big. It still is considered a pretty big story because there's video surveillance of her, of Emma, just looking um, very concerned or, or scared or paranoid. A lot of people think that she may have indeed had a stalker and that stalker was in following her. It kind of sounds like this is personal opinion, but it kind of sounds like she had some kind of mental illness that she was struggling with, right? And maybe because it was going untreated, it was just progressively getting worse. I'm also not a doctor or anything and I shouldn't be an armchair expert. Who knows? Because I was just reading a story the other day and I should have remembered his name. But this man, he had a mental illness that went untreated and he had some kind of breakdown and they found him like, 20 years later, he was still alive. Um, he had no idea how he got there. He was across the country. Oh, it was fascinating because I had never heard a story like that. Very vague <laughs> because I can't remember the details right now, but it was, I just was like, oh, okay. So this does happen more often. I don't know. I'm gonna have to dig around. I'm very curious to know like how often does this happen? And are people found when they have some kind of breakdown? Do they change their name and stuff? I don't know. I, anyways, but if this is Emma's case, then maybe she's still alive out there somewhere. And if you see her or have seen her, please reach out. I hope that's the case, you know? Or it's the other one that you, yeah. You know, let me know your thoughts down below. I love to hear your guys' theories and just what you guys think. I like it. I appreciate it. I like to understand what you guys are thinking. You know, sometimes your brains, they're good. Let's use them to use. Let's use them to use. All right. Wow. It's a great motivational sentence. <laughs> Oh my God. Okay, anyways, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I hope you have a wonderful day ahead of you. Please, please, please be safe out there. Make good choices, stay inside, stay safe. But other than that, I would love to know who you want me to talk about next week. I love and appreciate you guys. Be safe out there and I'll be seeing you guys later. Bye.